Good afternoon. How appropriate it is that we pause in the work of the annual conference to remember those saints who have gone before us, those honored members of the fellowship of the clergy, the spouses who have passed away. And are we yet alive? Not all of us are as we gather. And that creates some sadness in our hearts. But as Christian people who are part of a Christian community, we come to open our hearts before God that he might work his miracle of healing within us. That by the remembrance of these we love, that they are more dynamically alive to us as they've ever been. And as we ponder their presence with us, We celebrate the truth of the communion of saints. So let's open together our hearts as we stand and sing together for all the saints. may be seated. Would you please join me in this responsive prayer? Let us pray. I praise you, Lord, because you pulled me up. You didn't let my eyes celebrate over me, my enemies celebrate over me. You brought me up from the grave, back to life, from among those going down to the pit. All of you faithful to the Lord, sing praises to him. His anger lasts for a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. When I was comfortable, I said, I will never stumble. But when you hid your presence, I was terrified. What is to be gained if I go down into the pit? Does dust praise you? Does it proclaim your faithfulness? You changed my mourning into dancing. You took off my funeral clothes and dressed me in joy. 
so that my whole being can sing praises to you and never stop. Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Hear the reading of God's word from the 12th chapter of Hebrews. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race that marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, you know, there was no qualifiers no wavering in the mind of the reader, of the writer. There was no ifs or ands or buts about it. There's no maybe we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. It's a definitive statement. Since we are surrounded, there they are, filling the stands for the home team. The image is that of an arena, an athletic arena, the activity taking place on the stage. But the saints, those heroes of chapter 11, the saints of our lives, our honored dead are filling the stands. They're cheering us on. They're pulling for us. They're calling our names. They're wishing us the best. They're distracting the enemy. They're giving every advantage to us possible. This past year, the clouds have become fuller with the saints that we honor today. Our honor dead. The men and women who shared our commitment to Christ. Who shared our dedication to the church. And who now, as a part of the church triumphant, takes their place among the heroes of faith in the cloud of witnesses. Now, to be honest, the idea of entering the stand so that they could cheer us on down here is not what most of the folks that I've experienced who are actively dying think about. They don't say, oh, pastor, I can't wait to get to the cloud so I can cheer for you from up above. They don't say stuff like that. What I hear them say is, pastor, I'm so tired. And then they say, I want to go home. That's what they tell me. They tell me that they spent a lifetime working hard and they're ready for the rest of their labors. Hebrew mentions rest in like 12 different occasions before this chapter. And each occasion has a little different context. So we have to pay attention. Sometimes Hebrews is saying the rest that comes with the Sabbath rest. You know, the, the break that comes in the routine of every week. The time when we get reconnected and re-energized by God. The Sabbath rest. Sometimes the rest is being referred to as the, the completion of the journey. You know, they were in the wilderness a long time. The cold of night, the heat of the day, the drought of the wilderness, the battle to take the land. And finally, they get to rest. And there are occasions when the rest refers to eternal rest. Now, that's what I think they're thinking about. Pastor, I'm so tired. They're looking to rest from their labors. You know, the church developed a very powerful series of services to commend our souls, our loved ones, to God. It's called the Requiem, the request that God grant them rest. I've come to appreciate the power of those prayers. I've come to love the music of the requiem, grant them eternal God, eternal rest, and let perpetual light shine on them. How beautiful is that? 
O Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant them rest. And we pray that God grant these rest. Grant them eternal rest, O God. Because they labored, and they labored hard for their faith, they served God faithfully. Sometimes in the service of God, they comforted people, and that's wonderful because the people loved it, and it honored God, and it made the preacher proud that he could be at one with his people. But sometimes these saints know that by honoring God, they had to do things that afflicted the people, that angered the people, that that brought the Word of God in conflict with the patterns of God's heart, and, and there was clashing. And these saints know about that clashing. Sometimes their faithful service of God made them pay a price. The clouds, the witnesses in the clouds have paid a price for their faith. Now some of these were in ministry long ago when the salary scales were nothing like they are today. The pay was low. When I announced as a 19-year-old boy to my home congregation, 9th Street in Decatur, that I was going to go into the ministry, people were so excited, except my mom. She cried. (laughs) She cried because she she had the memory of going to church at Lacey Springs, just south of Huntsville, close to here. And her father, my grandfather, would go out the door and she would, he would palm the preacher a $20 bill because they didn't pay enough for the pastor to feed his family. Some of these saints know about the financial cost. And we went through in the early 60s, we went through a, a phase in congregational life where district superintendents would promise small churches everywhere that if you had a parsonage, you could have a station preacher and you would become a station. You would have a preacher there of your very own and you wouldn't have to share him with somebody else. None of this circuit riding stuff. So all over the conference, out in these rural areas, we began to build the best parsonage they could but they were still sub-par parsonages. The first parsonage I moved into was 30 by 30 concrete block with the roll-out casement windows, which was donated from a school that were replacing windows. Now, when the church gets a hand-me-down from the school, (laughs) that's not good. And their children, many of whom are sitting here in front of me, you, you paid a price for your mom and your dad's commitment. And don't think for a moment it didn't weigh heavy on the saint's heart. There was a civil rights movement. You know, there's this mindset It still exists today. It still exists in the white supremacy movement that African Americans are subpar and therefore they need to be suppressed in the world. And it's a wrong attitude. And many of your folks knew that. And so they fought it at every level and they fought hard. And not everybody was excited about that. Many of our pastors packed up and went north where congregations were more accepting. But these stayed. These stayed and paid the price for making the witness for racial equality. And then we went through the height of civil religion where we failed to figure out where do we put the American flag in the Christian church. I don't know about you guys, but I've got a wound or two about that one. Or the assertion of the role of women in the world. You know, some of the parents of these sitting before me, some of the mothers who were used to to ministry being a team ministry of the 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 father pastor and the 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 wife who would play the piano to be a, a help to the husband. I mean, some of these break them broke the mold. I was talking to the Stevensons. Helen Stevenson is on our list. How many of you know Helen Stevenson? 
as a teenager, I was invited to the Decatur First Parsonage. I don't know how it happened, but I remember seeing Helen Stevenson sitting in their little sunroom smoking a corn cob pipe. It was the first woman I ever knew who smoked a corn cob pipe. So those of you who are wives or husbands that are thinking you're cutting new territory by branching off, now you, you got a ways to go. Some of these saints paid the price long before you. you know, sacrifice is not new for us in ministry. The Apostle Paul was listing his five times. I've been lashed 40 times minus one. And three times I've been beaten with a rod. Three times I've been shipwrecked. Once I've been stoned. Once I was left out of the sea overnight. And then he, as though all of us would know, he says, and then there were the daily worries of the church. Oh, my. These saints that are filling the clouds, they know what it's like to worry about their churches. They know what it's like to struggle in lives, in living with families. May Prickett is on our list. May Prickett was one of mine. Forgive me for being possessive. She was a member at First Church Tuscaloosa. Bill still had a couple of years on the Jasper District, and May would come to church, and Bill would worship with her when he could. They'd already built a house, and all did Bill provide what May wanted. May wanted a little swimming pool so she could exercise her joints. She had arthritis really bad, and, and so there was a swimming pool so she could, she could work out with resistance that wouldn't hurt her. And she was a seamstress, and she had the finest sewing room you could ever. She, she showed off her sewing room to me. Now, I have to tell you, I don't know a lot about what ought to be in a sewing room. But it, she was so proud of what, oh, they loved each other. You remember Bill Prickett? You know, he had that black hair, that shiny black hair, and he would comb it back. And, and when he really wanted to look like a dude, I mean, he got his black suit, his black tie, and he looked like something. I mean, he looked good. <laughs> when he was first trying to diagnose what was going on with him, he was in, the, he was in a, a procedural room. May was sitting there, and I walked in, and, and every hair in his head was combed in perfect place. Why, Bill, you look great, I said. Ken, it's my, I've never had trouble with my looks. It's my lungs that's giving me trouble, he said. <laughs> May just rolled her eyes at him. You know, as a couple of months later, the disease has progressed a little bit. I was, he was in ICU. He was sitting up on the bed, and, and I looked over at May. She was on the other side of the bed, and, and I walked in. We were visiting a little bit, and he said, Ken, you want a good sermon? I said, Sure. Sure, Bill. And he said, May, go home and get in my drawer and any, any sermon in the file will do. Take out all the big words and give to Ken. <laughs> May just rolled her eyes. You see, she had lived with him. She knew the, and she could deal it out as well. It was in the last little bit of Bill's life. I went to the hospital to see him. May was sitting in the bed across. Ken, I've got a sermon for you. Oh, no, you don't, Bill. I'm not going to fall for that twice, I said. <laughs> no, Ken, I've, I've been working on a sermon. I need your help. I've been working on a sermon. I'm calling it the three births of a Christian. He said, of course, the first one is our birthday. It's the physical birth. It's the day we brought joy to our mothers and the fathers. It's the day we first took our breath to, to live in the beautiful world that God gave us. God gave us life. It's the celebration of physical birth. And the second birth, he said, he said that's, our, that's our spiritual birth. That's the day we accept Christ. We're born again into the Spirit of God and we live in union with Christ and we participate in his great purpose in the world to live abundantly full of joy and forgiveness and a part of something great. And he said the third death 
The third birth comes at our death. When we are born anew into eternal life. Then he said, Ken, you're going to have to finish this sermon for me. My delivery date is near. May didn't roll her eyes. Tears rolled out of her eyes that day. Oh, I could tell you more. I wish I could tell you stories of every single... I, I could tell you lots. Sydney Sandridge, I don't know how much the conference knows Sydney. Sydney was the president of Athens College. He signed my uh, graduation uh, certificate. He also signed Glenn. Signed mine as cum laude and Glenn's, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Glenn's just glad he got it. <laughs> laude, laude, that's right. <laughs> Sidney had a favorite word. His favorite word, now he was from Virginia, so he said alt and about, funny like. And his favorite word was grand. Isn't that grand? Isn't this a grand school to be a part of? And I, you know, and I guess if God were to bless me with one legacy, it would be that somebody thought I thought something was grand. What a, what a gift Sydney brought to us. Everybody on this list have paid the price. They have the scars to prove it. They know better than, than most folks what it's like to be a pastor. They know what it's like to go through the struggles that we face again and again. They're in the clouds. They're cheering us on because they understand what it's like to be in active ministry. They know the headaches of betrayal. They know the, what it's like to be the target of criticism. They know what it's like to be in a fishbowl where everybody's watching. They know better than most. And so who better to cheer us on? than those who have walked in our shoes. Brian Stevenson is a, an attorney, the director of the Equal Justice Institute in Montgomery. He is one of God's gifts to America. He's incredible. He tells of giving a speech on one occasion. He was just giving a speech in a church and there, at tour, there at, as he was beginning his speech there, uh, 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 an old black man was rolled into the, to the sanctuary. He sat at the back, and he had this stern, hard look on his face. And he was just staring at, at Brian. And Brian said, I, I didn't know what I did, but he just looked angry the entire time I was speaking. And, and he said, after the sermon was, after the, the talk was delivered, people came forward. They were very nice, and they greeted him, and he autographed a book or two, which you all ought to get. Uh, just mercy is the title of it and and he and he spoke to people and then the the old man rolled himself down wheeled himself down to the front and he said young man do you know what you're doing shook his finger at him uh, Brian said I didn't I didn't know what to say he said young man do you know what you are doing and Brian said he babbled a word or two. And he said, young man, do you know what you're doing? I'm going to tell you what you're doing. You're beating the drum for justice. That's what you're doing. Keep beating the drum for justice. Brian was deeply moved by these man's words. He, he was so moved by the passion. And he was greatly relieved because he didn't know what the guy was going to say. And the man reached up and grabbed him by the collar and he pulled him into his wheelchair. And he says, young man, you see this cut behind my ear? I got that in Greene County, Alabama in 1963 working for registering black folks to vote. And do you see this scar over here on my neck, down on my shoulder? He said, I got that scar in Philadelphia, Mississippi when I was registering black folk to vote. And you see this dark spot in my head? That's my bruise. I got my bruise in Birmingham, Alabama in 1965. And my young man, when people see me, they see an old man in a, in a wheelchair all cut and bruised and, and uh, scarred. But I want you to know, these are not my cuts. These are not 
my scars. These are not my bruises. They are my medals of honor. These saints, with their medals of honor, are looking down upon us, encouraging us to be faithful. And as this is the most difficult time of ministry in my 46 years of active ministry, I, it's hard. It's hard because it's seemingly impossible for us to somehow lasso the extremes of our church and bring them together. And it's incredibly difficult on the local church pastor. These saints know something about what that's like. And they're cheering us on. They're encouraging us. I've got a confession to make. I love watching these little short clips on BuzzFeed. Y'all ever watch those things? You know, some of them are inspiring. Some of them are stirring. Some of them are incredibly funny. And some of them move me to tears. It's just incredible. A couple of weeks ago, I was watching a little eight-minute clip, and the clip was saying, what made Simon cry? And and it was uh, the X Factor Britain. And a 22-year-old car mechanic was the last audition of the day. It was the first auditions, and and he was the last of the day. He was there, lived with his mom. His name was Josh, and he was there to, to sing. Simon said, well, Josh, you're the last one. He said, yes, you've been waiting all day. Yes, sir. You know what happens the last one? Josh says, yeah, they either do incredibly good or incredibly bad. And they all laughed. And he said, well, what are you going to sing for us? And he said, well, I'm going to sing the song Jealous by Labyrinth. Well, tell us about why you chose that. He said, well, I don't sing it the way Labyrinth sings it. Labyrinth wrote the song out of a jilted love relationship. And and the the sweetheart was was going on. She was moving on and she was jilting the guy. And and the guy is jealous because she's gone on and she didn't come back. You know, absence didn't make the heart grow fonder. Uh, Absence reminded her why she didn't want to go back. And so, so he was jealous that she was doing really well without him. And Josh says, uh, but I don't sing that about a woman. I sing it about my high school friend who died years back when he was 18. We, we did everything together. We ran around together. We laughed together. We dated together. We, he was my best friend. And when he died, I didn't know what to do. Okay, said Simon. Let's hear it. So Simon began to sing. I'm jealous of the rain that falls upon your skin. It's closer than my hands have ever been. I'm jealous of the rain. Because I wish you the best of all this world could give. And I told you when you left me there's nothing to forgive. But I've always thought that you would come back and you'd tell me you found was heartbreak and misery. And it's hard for me to say, I'm jealous of the way you're happy without me. Then they do a little clip. And he said, my friend's in heaven and it's far better than this. and, And I'm delighted for him, but I'm a little bit jealous. And then he goes back to the live performance and he hits it with new emphasis. I'm jealous. I wish you the best that all the world could give. I told you when I when he left me that there was nothing left to forgive. But I've always thought you would come back and tell me all you found was heartbreak and mystery. It's hard for me to say. I'm jealous of the way you're happy without me. I mean, it devastated the audience. 
Everybody's wiping tears. The judges were virtually speechless. What they said was, was almost in, in, unintelligible. I mean, it, it touched them so deeply. He got three yeses, an, an incredible emotional standing ovation. When he walked off the stage, he met his mom, as he called her. And she wrapped her arms around him. And then, if you listen closely, you could hear him say, I hope I did him proud. Then his mother says back, you did, you did him proud, my son. You did. It's my prayer that when you and I have fought the fight, when you and I have finished our course, if we have kept the faith, I pray that when you and I say, I hope we did them proud, that we might hear in return, you did them proud. You did. Amen. Amen. Join together now in the prayer of confession. The Lord be with you. Please join our voices and our hearts together in this prayer. O oh God, who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask, our failures before we confess. Grant us now your grace that even as we shrink before the mystery of death, we might glimpse the light of your eternity. Speak to us once more your words of life and of death. Help us to live as those prepared to die. And when our days come to their end, enable us to die as those who go forth to live, that in living or dying, we may be yours. Amen. Let us join our hearts together in prayer in silence. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Join in proclaiming the good news. Nothing in life or death will separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory to God. Amen. Let us now prepare our hearts and our minds for communion as we share together in the great thanksgiving. With God's people on earth and all the company of heaven, let us join the unending praise to our God. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night when he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of the faith. 
Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in communion with all your saints. We give thanks to you for the great cloud of witnesses, and we seek your strength to run with perseverance the race that is set before us until we join in that eternal feast at your heavenly table through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. The body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ broken for us. The blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for us. With confidence in God's eternal communion, let us join together in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As I looked at the front of this bulletin, and I was reminded of our conference theme, singing God's song in new places with new faces, it occurred to me that these whose lives we are celebrating today are doing that just now. And even as they do, they are a part of the great cloud of witnesses encouraging us. And so... Offer a prayer of thanksgiving in your heart as each name is read. Mrs. Mary Archibald. Reverend Johnny L. Bannister. Reverend T.H. Buzz Barrett. Reverend Ruth Jackie Brown. Mrs. Helen Irene Burbank. Reverend Charles Calhoun Sr. Reverend Marshall Coker Kit Carson. Mrs. Hazel Christelier. Reverend John Clark. Reverend Alfred H. Cooper. Reverend James Goodwin. Reverend George Gray. Reverend H. Wayne Green. Reverend Charles D. Hazel. Mrs. Mavis O. Hopkins. Reverend Cloisy Johnson. Mrs. Judy Johnson. Mrs. Dorothy C. McDonald. Reverend Kirk C. Minor. Reverend Robert 
Man for Reverend Larry D. Mousley. Reverend Franklin Phillips. Mrs. May Prickett. Mrs. Susan Putnam. Reverend Robert E. Ross. Dr. San Sidney Sandridge. Dr. Sherry Lynn Savage. Reverend Jesse B. Shaddix. Mrs. Dolores C. Shaw. Reverend William H. Smith. Reverend Michael P. Sparks. Reverend William Brian Spiller. Mrs. Helen Stevenson. Reverend John Stewart. Reverend John David Thompson. Mrs. Hilds Jean Windsor. Mrs. Cindy Witherington. With their names resounding in the room and their encouragement from the clouds, we're going to come together and receive Holy Communion in remembrance of the communion of saints. You'll be invited and led by ushers to receive communion. Will you come? And please now receive the benediction. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who encourage and support us along life's journey. Go forth from this place thankful for the gift that they have been and continue to be to us. Go in God's peace. Amen. <laughs>